welcome to Online for Authors. Today I am chatting with Robert Blake Whitehill, author of Dead Rise. Welcome, Robert. Uh, it's great to be with you here, Terry. This is a, a real pleasure to visit with you. I am super excited. I, I finished the book. I loved it. Before oh, we good. really, yeah, before we really get into it, though, yeah, why don't you give listeners just like the elevator pitch? What is and so it's book number one, yes. right? One of six. What what are they going to find when they open up the cover? When they open up Dead Rise, they're going to find that a former Navy SEAL is diving for oysters using a commercial diving helmet in the Chesapeake Bay in November. Very chilly. And then he discovers the very recent wreck of a speedboat on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. And aboard that boat are 20 metal cases. 19 of the cases are filled with gold bullion, millions of dollars worth. The 20th metal case has a dirty bomb in it with its timer ticking down to zero 24 hours away. But at the helm of the boat is the body of a man that Ben Blackshaw, our hero, hasn't seen in 15 years, his father. And that's where we kick it off. And that's where we kick it off. And let me tell you guys, what he just said is essentially that beginning chapter that sucks you in so deep that immediately uh, you're like, okay, now I got to I gotta find out what's going on here. So why don't you explain the title? I was very surprised very quickly. It was like, oh, that's what Dead, Ride is, Dead Rise is. So tell me, what is the title? Uh, a Dead Rise, it has a double entendre in the, in the, as you go along in the book. Right. But a Dead Rise is a kind of work boat. The way, you, if you were up around Maine, a down easter is a kind of work boat. And it refers to a particular angle. Uh, if you were looking at the back of the boat, it's the angle, the V that's made okay. at the back of the boat. But they named the whole boat after that. So it's a dead rise. It's a work boat. And it's used by watermen in the Chesapeake Bay, particularly, to uh, harvest the goods of the Chesapeake, from crabs to oysters um, to mussels. There was actually a, a terrapin business, a fishery for terrapins yes. for a while. But they reproduced so slowly that they basically burned through all the available terrapins in about two seasons. So yes, that was the end of that. Went, yep, that was that. <laughs> and uh, but that's that's where the phrase "dead rise" comes. It's a okay. it's a, it's like the horse for the waterman, a cowboy's horse, but for the waterman, it gets them around Super. through all their seasons of work that they have to do on the Chesapeake. Yeah. So I learned a lot about being on the water from mm. from reading. My first question, though, is is this all this story pretty much happens exclusively on Smith Island. Is that a real island in Chesapeake Bay? You bet is it is. It, if, okay. it actually is. Just 70 miles from Washington, D.C., you find this wonderful archipelago, small islands and people living on them. And they originated 400 some years ago from Cornwall. And they still have the Elizabethan way of uh, sort of an accent and some of their... Uh, their manners of speech or, or figures of speech are a little peculiar, but they were actually coming from pirate stock in Cornwall, southwest of England. And the king got so sick of their predations on commerce at, in the sea that the, they started sending ships of the line to capture and destroy these Cornish people who were out in the waters taking what they could take. And the people of Cornwall said, it's a little too hot in the neighborhood right now. <laughs> we're we're going to head out. <laughs> yeah. We're emigrating to the new world and we are going to take up residence on the, uh, on Smith Island, also on Tangier Island, right, which is also right. in the Chesapeake, but in Virginia instead of Maryland. And so that's some of the antecedents of the people of uh, Smith Island. They are, uh, it's a real place. They're wonderful people. They had kind of that, piratical history but today they are the nicest coolest devout methodist that you could ever want to find so what i thought was interesting was the island almost became a character do yeah. you know what i'm saying like uh, like it's, it's it's a quirky island they have it's they have some of their little quirks and their little and the, and the people living on it are 
they they know everyone's business, but nobody pretends that they know anyone's business, and they're all <laughs> acting like right. They they all act like they're all by themselves, and yet they know exactly what's happening in every moment of every area at all times. You know, um, which reminds me of living in a small town. You know, oh, yes. just, right. The idea that everybody knows everything, but I thought that the quirkiness came out so that Smith Island was almost a character. It is very much so. Um, there are times these days where all the roads are awash with the high tides. So it's an island where you could live very happily in an isolated way, but it could come and get you uh, yeah. as well, as yeah. can the Chesapeake. I'm sure you're familiar with places that are uh, difficult to navigate. On, and one minute they're very calm, and the next minute there's this storm and the huge roll right. cloud coming at you about to drown you or knock you on your beam end. So it's, right. yeah, the environment, the setting, whether they're on shore or on the water, I very much intended for, to be like a character in the book. I'm so happy that you saw well, yeah, that. So, so you did a really good job with that because it felt it's like the story couldn't have existed without being there on that island. It needed that island for that story to make sense. Thank you. Great. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so are you from this area or did you have to do a ton of research or both? both. I am <laughs> yeah. I'm from the Eastern shore of Maryland, okay. which is that peninsula that makes up the uh, Eastern side of the Chesapeake Bay. So that's okay. where I'm from. Uh, it also the the southern tip of it also has a little bit of Virginia on it, um, and the Delmarva Peninsula is where I grew up, uh, sailing the tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay, the Chester River being a favorite, um, and so I was keenly aware of the importance of the seafood industry because right. these men and women were out on their dead rise work boats, working the water depending on the season for oysters, tonging for oysters. Uh, or working for the crabs, running trot lines for crabs, or setting crab pots. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of research. I did, of course, go to Smith Island uh, several times, and the people were so nice when they heard that I was trying to write about them. Uh, they they sort of opened up a little bit about what was going on and the, the history of the place. Right. Um, I also... Um, as a pilot was able to fly out to Tangier Island and land there and was able to do some walking around and uh, learning more about Tangier Island because they figure the Tangier they people <laughs> figure a little bit in the course of the story. Yeah. So, so I research so is important. Research. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and it felt very real. And for someone who doesn't know a lot about the fishing industry and those kinds of things, you know, you were using terminology, but you did it in a way that I could follow what, what was happening. But it did feel like you did know, you know, he's he's under there and he's he's looking for things and he's he, he's really cold and this is what's happening. And it it did give you a real sense of, okay, so being a fisherman is not an easy occupation. This oh, was my gosh. Tough, this was tough. It is a hard scrabble existence. Yeah. Um, but their independence relies on their keeping up. And they'll, you know, some of them may guide uh, gunning trips for geese in the fall. And um, there are other sort of side jobs. Many of the women aren't actually out on the boat on a, on a, from a day-to-day -day basis, but they will be uh, taking care of these soft shell crabs in these big trays and making sure that when the shell is softest, uh, just molted, they'll fish them up and put them on ice. And that's another industry. And they're very uh, uh, integral to the, um, to the success of a family, for example, is to keep all those aspects of the fishery going at once. Stop. Right. One of the things that, that you brought up just over the generations as you were kind of talking about the history of the place was the fact that governmental regulations would really throw a wrench into what they were doing. So they would they would have a way in which they were earning money. And then all of a sudden a regulation would come that would would change everything. And then, you know, were they going to follow the regulations or were they going to try to go behind the backs and, and you know, sneak a little because they felt that the regulations were unfair to them, unjust to their way of life. You make a very good point. If 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 you were working as a game warden and you were detailed to go out to Smith Island 
and you were trying to do it undercover, if there was the least suspicion that you were about to impinge upon what they were able to put on the table or send off in barrels to the restaurants of Washington and Baltimore and New York and other places, if they thought that you were in there to, to throw the monkey wrench into it, you might not come back to the mainland. There was yeah. a there was a, a virulent dislike, and then uh, Glenn Martin uh, from aviation fame, early aviation fame, he uh, purchased a huge amount of uh, the land just to the north of the main Smith Island archipelago, where the three little hamlets are, and he turned it into a wildlife refuge. So if you were to go there as a Smith Islander, you were in jeopardy of right. being arrested and fined. And it was, um, so yes, government regulations, Washington being only 70 miles away, as we said, um, that could really throw a, a, a spanner in the works of not just making pocket money, but providing for your family. Exactly, exactly. So you're talking about people that this is what they relied on. And then all of a sudden they're now, it was like the duck hunting and all of that changed and there was everything that they they would do normally and then it's like okay well you can still get oysters but only this many and only at this time of, of year and only in these places and now you can't go here where you've always been before and and all of the other rules and regulations and it and there was a, a distaste <sighs> For so one of your characters is someone who is supposed to be, you know, out patrolling and 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 whatnot. And yeah, they kind of like they feel like she turned on them because she, she was did. a Smith Island girl, and now look at what she's doing. She's working for the feds, right? Yep, she's working for the <laughs> natural resources police, right? And uh, but yes, you're right. It was a it was that gradual encroachment on their their hunting lands and their waters. Um, and you've characterized it wonderfully, but to be on in the natural resources police and patrolling your neighbors and some days patrolling even your family, right? Uh, that, that's definitely the case. And they, for, for example, they used to use very large bore uh, guns to hunt and shoot down as many geese and, and ducks, ducks as they right. possibly could from these small little punt boats. They're called punt guns or market guns and they were 12 15 feet long and when shot money for shot was scarce they would load them up with nuts and bolts and nails and things like that and the the joke that was going around baltimore was that if they got a barrel that was packed with smith island ducks uh one restaurateur decided hell i'm gonna i'm gonna close up my restaurant and open up a hardware store for yes. all the <laughs> the bits and pieces, pieces that, were that we find in it this, right yeah, they could knock down where where a hunter is grateful if he can snag one, maybe two uh, geese or ducks. Uh, they were hitting 30, 40, sometimes right. 50 at a time with these right. guns. They were so and then, big. And then those guns were, you know, completely outlawed. That's right? the thing that happens, which, yeah. Which is what happens. And then... Um, not to give too much away, but but we see some of that come back later, which I loved how that happened. That was a that was a fun little twist. Um, I'm curious about your writing, whether you're a plotter or whether you're a pantser. Like when you got started, did you know where you were ending? Did you have it all laid out, or or are you more of a seat of the pants kind of writer? I might know some of the beats in advance. Um, mm -hmm. But but everything that is sort of the tweener parts that connects them all together, characters are born one day that I'd never expected the day before. Um, so I would say that I'm a combination. My rules for when I can start a story is I need to know the ending. Mm -hmm. I need to know a good title. And I need to know who is going to die in the first paragraph. Oh, isn't that and if, funny? <laughs> if I've got all of those things, those three things squared away, then I'm ready to go seat of the pants, as you it, said. Isn't that funny? So I'm a pantser and Good. I am I am terrible when it comes to titles. So if I had to have a title to get started, I would yet to have a book. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> right. I it's, hear you. It's, yeah. I'm so bad at it. My first book came out. I had it to the editor. We went back and forth with a title probably for four or five weeks. I thought wow. the I thought the book was going to come out as unnamed by uh -huh. Terry M. Brown because right. 
I just could not come up with a name. I find it to be the most difficult part of writing to take this this thing that I've I've produced and then come up with two or three words that are going to make. It's like I don't know. I don't like it. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not good at it. It's it's really tough for me. Do you, have you evolved any rules for yourself in the time since that first one? Well, yeah. I I know now. I think the first time I was trying to be. I don't know. I was trying to be way too literal, uh -huh. right. you know, and I now know that I don't have to be quite so literal and that I can, I can play a little mm -hmm. and it, it needs to, it needs to touch on what my story is, but it doesn't have to sum it up in three words or less. There you go. I'm which with you a hundred percent, which sure. has helped, but I still, I think there's still that I don't, it's a dread. It's like, Oh, I oh need my. to name something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody once said that my, the, the titles of my first three or four books sounded like a, a, uh, a brand of coffee or a kind, a flavor of coffee between yeah. Dead Rise, Nitro Express, Tap Rack Bang. All of these things sounded like stuff that you would name a, a kind of coffee to get you going in the morning. And, exactly. Um, exactly. And that was a rule of thumb for a minute or two, and then I branched out into other names that might have other significances. So you you evolve as a writer, of course. You do. I and I'm I'm hoping that as I go on, that the naming becomes easier. Although I'm working on manuscript four, and I still don't have a clue for that one. So that's All right. you know, but it's okay. I'm going to allow it. Um, so you have an ending. Have you ever? been writing though and the ending has to change <laughs> well funny you should ask in one book i killed a character and when the readers read that the hate mail began to pour in the mm -hmm. character was beloved and i in the, the beginning of the next book had to make explanations about why the character was still alive Yes, and, because they just weren't going to take it. Yeah. Yes. My first draft, especially of the first book, they're for me. I get to do that. But when I realize that I'm serving a readership all of a sudden, I need to take into account their taste as readers. And right. I, I learn from them. I take my lessons as clearly and as uh, quickly as I can. Right. So you said that you get mail. I'm curious, though, do you also look at your reviews? I do. Absolutely. Yeah, see, some I'm, authors don't. Yeah, some authors are yeah. like, I refuse. I look at all of mine. I was just curious. So so what do you do with your reviews? Like, do you do you really take them to heart? Do you if you for instance, if you get a review that isn't great, does it does it like ruin your day or do you just let it slide off your back? How do you handle these? Of course, it ruins my day. <laughs> And I could have read five awesome reviews, five five-star reviews, but I'll read the, the bad one. And it takes me, you know, a good 20, 30 minutes to sort of recover my sense of self and my confidence and faith in my abilities. Um, but uh, what I do with good reviews is I might break them out into particular lines. And uh, when I'm working with interns I, who are there to sort of learn about marketing, I will ask them to incorporate the lines and create a link to the review right. and they'll go off and do that and spare me that labor. But it's, um, it's, it, it can go either way, I tell you, but I'm learning. And with six books in, I've learned not to be too harsh. What I have learned now that they're published in German and I have to go through the, I must now translate it into from German into English. They're a tough market, but they are keep they? reading. They are. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, they're. so it's interesting. I do, I do what you do. I tell everyone that if I get a bad review, I, I have all the feels oh and boy. I go, and I go ahead and, you know, like the woe is me and, you know, I must be a horrible author and I can't believe they would write that. And, oh, and yeah. then, and then once I get it out of my system, it's like, okay, so my book's not for everyone. And then I move on, but I do, I do go ahead and allow myself to do all of the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. That <laughs> yeah, I will marvel. I will marvel a little bit at a bad review where it's very clear they read the whole book. And yeah. 
So there's that. I don't know what to make of it, but you know, I as a reader, if I'm not engrossed and engaged, I I'll quit set the book aside. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. there you are. Yeah. Well, um, I, I saw someone who said, who read a review. It was it was a joke, but it was like this is the the worst book I've ever read, and you're the worst author oh ever. And the and the author comes back and says, "But you have heard of me." <laughs> <laughs> right. So there is kind of that, well, at least, you know, at least you read it, right? You're out there. I like that very much. Yeah, I, I yep. like that idea. So this is book one of six. Yep. So far, yes. So, and that's, the, so that was one of my questions. Yeah. Is there going to be more of the Ben Blackshaw or are you going to veer into something else instead? When it comes to veering, I leave that to my screenwriting to diversify the characters, settings, plots, and things of that nature. But I very much like Ben Blackshaw, and I've published uh, Dead Rise purely with the intent of that being a one-off. And then I realized people are really responding to it. It's a group of characters that I have come to know well and like, right? and it's a setting that I have the utmost admiration for and a people that I have the utmost admiration for. So maybe there's another book in it. And so that's how the the series uh, began. I have quietly promised myself uh, a, a minimum of 10 uh, okay. books and I'll be uh, starting work on the 7th come January, I think. Fantastic. So Thank I was you. wondering, yes. because, it, you know, and on Amazon, it says one of six or two of yep. six, right? And so I wondered, well, is there more or did he wrap it up? I haven't read number six yet, so I wasn't sure if you'd wrapped it up so tightly that there couldn't be more or if you'd left that open. So now we know. It's definitely yeah. an open for sure. So you, you say that these characters are, you know, you really like them. Who is your favorite character? It's one of the baddies that I've got to say. I mean, Blackshaw is a good guy. He's a he's a moral enforcer. He fights for the little guy and to protect his home and hearth. And when he ventures farther away from Smith Island, he's he's again fighting for the um, for people who aren't strong enough to stand up for themselves. But in the first couple of books, there is a baddie. Uh, named Maynard Chalk, and people yeah. find that he's a real scene stealer, and he's psychotic in the best of ways. He he he's run out of his risperidol, and <laughs> really needs his anti-psychotic, anti-hallucination uh, drugs. But he's finding that, as many have, that he's quicker and sharper and more alert and a little more aggressive if he's not medicated. So he's kind of let that prescription go. And he's very practical and devastatingly pragmatic. For example, if one of his henchmen was shot and killed and there's a freezer nearby, he'll put the corpse in the freezer and sell off parts and organs of that person to the black right. market. Right. He's got that kind of practicality and remorseless look at the world around him some so, someone who's no longer functioning the way he needs them to and he just kills them he just he, yep. i don't need them in my i don't need them in my back pocket anymore they're dragging me down and and he moves on right they're a burden they are a, a paycheck that they have to do maybe a pension off with them yep. so it's it's tough working for that guy yeah, uh, he's he was a little scary to me. In fact, you know, I know it was off of his meds because he says so right away. And yeah. and I'm kind of like, ooh, ooh, we need to find his buddy, his meds. He's right. <laughs> his, but would he little, take them? A little off kilter. No, he would not. No, no, yeah. I do not think that he would. Right. So one of one of the characters that I really liked was Knocker Ellis. Oh yeah, he's cool. I, I just there was cool. just something about him. He was he he doesn't really belong on the island. He comes to the island to to take care of Ben after Ben's father disappears, and he he I don't know. It's like he just he makes himself part of the island, even though no one really wants him there, but no one's willing to tell him to go away. It's, I think it's like they all know why he's there, but nobody wants him there anyway. And I don't know. I just I like him. He's very practical as well, and he just. I don't know. There was just something about him where I thought, I, I think I like this dude. I think I could sit down and have a good chat with him. I am glad. It would be a, maybe a one-sided chat. He's kind of yes, laconic. He's, yeah. <laughs> but there's the 
I have a feeling for him that, you know, and I tried to create this as all the stories go forward, that there's an air of mystery about him. He yeah. has information that the reader doesn't know, and he has information that Ben Blackshaw might not know, or other significant secondary and tertiary characters might really want to know, but he only reveals these things in dribs and drabs, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing to craft this guy. I like him too. He's yeah. fun. He's kind of fun in my view because he um, his sense of humor is super dry. Very dry, uh, and and you're yeah. not even sure. Sometimes it's like, was was that a joke? Was that <laughs> <laughs> right? Where's Absolutely. he going with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he. I, I just found that character to be to be really fascinating. I also liked Ben's girlfriend. Yes, she is and great. She just she has a, a, a unusual sense. There were a couple of things that you had her do that that made me laugh. Uh, one in particular, where she licked him to find out where he'd been. Aha! Uh -huh. you... <laughs> yes. Like, how, is it sweat from work on land? Is it? Does he taste like the brackish water mixed with his regular sweaty sort of thing? So she's very canny. I mean, yes. she is a tremendous detective. And I, since some of the characters, they go through periods in the books when they're apart from one another, they need to sort of come together on similar, on the same page, the same conclusions, each in their own way. Right, um, right. Black. And her her ways were very fascinating to me. I kind of thought, oh, I, I kind of like her too. She has a, I don't know, just a way about her. And like you said, Ben is fantastic. It's not that he's not a great character. But I think he's more the character you expect. Yes, yes, for, indeed. For a book of this type, you need a character like Ben. Yes. And, and he fits that role perfectly. But some of these secondary characters add some flavor that, you also really need, you know. And that do you did you feel as you were reading it that the the primary and some secondary characters each had an arc of growth in some yes. way, shape, or form? Okay. Yes. Great. So so you know, yes, we're watching Ben, but there's also these other characters that you're seeing. You know, like what are, what are they doing now, and how are they how are they handling all that's going on? No, I was right. I was very very intrigued with the book. I read it quite quickly actually once oh. I got going I, I I had it on my list and then I didn't pick it up for a long time just because my own reading life was crazy and I didn't have time but boy once I got started it was like yeah don't bother me I have to finish this <laughs> I'm so glad I am so, <laughs> so glad that's, so that's really good that's so, a great compliment thank you yeah so I know that you say you've got at least four more that you would like to write in this series right do you think you'll ever branch out and do something beyond Ben Blackshaw or do you think as far as books or yeah. okay um yeah. I would say it's possible I, I have had some you know some thoughts that I think um, would be completely different. And I resist incorporating some of the ideas into the Blackshaw stories as if they were new characters or new plots or new settings. Right. Um, so yes, I would do that. Um, and the other question is, might I work them into a screenplay? The, you know, yeah. a novel is anywhere from 40,000 words to 100,000 and up. And a script tend to tends to be about 18,000 words, maybe 20, depending. And so uh, I focus a, a, a fair amount on on diversif keeping my palette fresh by going into writing scripts. Writing scripts. That's something I have never done is write a script. And I don't know that I would be very good at it because a lot of my characters have a lot of head noise things okay. that are going on up here that in a script you've got to find a way to get it out of here and and out where people right. where people can't be inside the head of your character in a book i mean in a, in a movie sure right? it's and very so, difficult action yeah. is character in a movie right um and we know that dialogue could be a lie it could be true they could be saying what's true they could be hiding what's true in the dialogue so yeah it's it's different you have to sh figure out a way um to show the interior as it's crucial and if it's not get on with the action 
Yeah, Very I know. True. I know. And yeah. and yeah, I'm definitely I tell people that I, I have the, the tendency to what I call wander in the woods a little bit. And right. and and so you can't do that when you only have 18,000 words versus, yeah. you know, 80,000 words. There's a lot of wandering that has to be taken out. and You have to get right down to the crux of the matter. Probably it's would true. be a. I was going to say it might actually be a really good thing to try just to learn to like sharpen my wandering skill. <laughs> well, if you were to write a short film uh, mm -hmm. of about, you know, 10 pages, 15 pages, uh, where you've got to have the beginning, middle and end, I think that would be a, a very interesting exercise without the onus of, I must now have a screenplay that I can send right. around right, or right. something like that. But as an exercise, I wholly support your giving a shot and seeing how you can demonstrate what is happening in, in, on the interior by what the behaviors and actions are. And, right. you know, it, is my main character reliable? Is my main character uh, a liar? It does, you know, it's very interesting. Having worked on the adaptations of the Blackshaw books, uh, I can tell you a lot goes by the boards and a lot has to be indicated uh, very quickly. Very, It's like the haiku right. versus the epic lay, you know? <laughs> Well, and it's interesting. I think it's one of the reasons why generally I enjoy books more than I enjoy the movie. If I've read the book, I go to the movie and it's kind of like, yeah, it's good, but it's not as good as the book. And it's, interesting. Because, yeah. it's because for me, I enjoy a lot of that extra that you can't get in a movie. I really yeah. enjoy that piece of it. Um, so I love a good movie. But if I'm going to read the book, I probably won't watch the movie because very rarely am I satisfied. I also am rarely satisfied with who they pick to play the parts. Oh, yeah. You know, I look yeah. and I'll think, oh, that person is just not. Oh, and their voice is all wrong. And oh, just, you know. <laughs> well, when you're reading, you're the perfect director. Yeah. You're the casting yeah. director. And, you know, you've got either an actual actor in mind, perhaps, or someone that you've created in your mind. In your, yeah. In yeah. cooperation with the author out of whole cloth. I totally get that. Yeah, but I'm, it, I, I tell people I have a vivid imagination. And so when I'm reading, yeah. I hear it. I smell it. I've got it all yep. going on. And then I watch the movie and it's like, eh. It's, right. My, my head was wow. better. <laughs> there you go. That's very cool. I like that. I like that a lot. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start this book in January, book right. number seven. Yeah. When when do you think it will come out for those readers who are dying to get your next one? September-ish. Okay. Yeah. I w my rule is, um, and I don't know exactly if I'm going to follow it on this particular story. I, I'm thinking of making it a little bit shorter than typical for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be just as, you know, spit fiery and, and fun as I can make it, as I always strive to do. Um, but I'll be writing about five pages a day, five days a week. Okay. And that brings me up to after a calendar month, I will have a hundred pages and I'll do that for a couple, two, three months and four months perhaps, and then get into the editing, uh, right. part of it and polishing it. Right. So, um, but I would say with all of that that needs to be done, there needs to be a cover design. Right. Uh, there needs to be uh, a few other things that have to take place as well, you know. Well, and there's um, all the interior stuff and then there's oh, yeah. getting all of your marketing stuff in place and all of the Ooh. other things that have to go on. Right. Because it's not like you write a book and you turn it in and it becomes, you know it's online ready to go the next day. It's there's a lot of work between I think I'm done and you're not because then your editor gets hold of it, but you know, you think you're done yes. and, and, and to the point where it actually goes out to the public eye, there's a lot, there's a lot in between those two. So much. Two dots, yes. Right. Yes. And wasn't that a big surprise once we got the yeah. uh, first draft <laughs> yeah. done? Yeah. <clears throat> I thought I was, I thought I was just going to write. And then I found out, Oh no, there's all kinds of things going on here. I have to write. I have to, I have to edit. I have to market. I have all kinds of things that are going on. Right. Very true. Very true. <laughs> Very true. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, hey, guys, if you want to continue this conversation, head on over to Novels and Latte Book Club on Facebook. There you're going to be able to win a copy of Dead Rise. Um, Robert has offered to, to give us a copy of that. So head on over uh, tell something that you liked or learned about this podcast, and you will have the opportunity to win a digital copy of his book. So, Robert, if someone wanted to get up with you, chat with you about this series, um, other things that you're writing, how do they do that? How do they get up with you? Well, they can go to robertblakewhitehill.com. Okay. That's uh, semi-current. <laughs> and um, I have my uh, an email address on that site. So Super. if you can, uh, folks can write, ask questions. Uh, I, I'm happy to entertain those. Uh, anytime somebody cares to reach out, um, I, 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 the care and feeding of a readership is very important to me as I know it yeah. is to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll have all those links in the show notes for anybody who wants to, to reach out to you. Perfect. So, yeah. Robert, thank you for being on the show and readers run right out and grab Dead Rise and the other five that go with it. Um, it it really is a great series and it will keep you on the edge of your seat. And I enjoyed it. And then once you've read it, make sure that you review it because as authors, you know how much we love those reviews. They're crucial. It's they been are. such a pleasure meeting you and talking with you, Terry. I'm so Thank grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of Character Driven Fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.